So if you're deciding to train martial arts as like a physical pastime, then probably self-defense figures somewhere into your view of what it's for, right? Hello and welcome. You are listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 554 with Mr. Glenn Murphy. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. And if you want to know more about what we do, go to whistlekick.com. It's our online home, and it's also the easiest place to buy our products. And if you buy some, use the code PODCAST15, saves you 15%, and helps us know that this show is something that you value enough to make a purchase. The show gets its own website, though. It's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two new episodes every single week with a goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining you, the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to support the work that we're doing here, whether through a purchase or another way, you've got some choices. You could share an episode, you could follow us on social media, you could pick up one of our books, you could tell a friend, you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you could support the Patreon. If you think the new shows we're doing are worth 63 cents a piece, not to mention all the back episodes you get access to, consider supporting us for $5 a month. You could do as low as two. But even at $2 a month, we're going to give you more content. The more money you're willing to contribute to us, the more content we're going to give you. Today's guest, Mr. Glenn Murphy, holds the distinction of being the first, as far as I can tell, I did a quick check. So if I miss somebody, I'm really, really sorry. But he is the first Sistema practitioner that we've had on the show. Now, that's not his only martial art. At least, it's not what he started with. And so we get a really interesting conversation about not only his story, but Sistema and how it relates to martial arts that you may know better and how his life has changed as his martial arts experience and training has changed. So let's check that out. Hey, Mr. Murphy, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. Hey, of course. Appreciate you being here. And I told you this when we were chatting just a few minutes ago. I'm pretty sure you hold a distinction in that your your art, while not hidden, you know, e- easy enough to to know about it. The name, when I'm sure it comes up, will um, people will have heard of it. But I think you're the first guest on Martial Arts Radio with that style. Wow, I'm honored. <laughs> hard hard to keep track, you know, 500 yeah. and something episodes, you know. Yeah, that's track, a lot. But, that's, yeah. but uh yeah, I'm I'm excited to to talk to you and get some more perspective Great. on what you do. Uh, but of course, we start in a boring way. Not a boring way. We start in a obvious way because mm-hmm. I haven't come up with a better way to start. Right? Just, <laughs> you generally start at the beginning. And so, what's your martial arts beginning? Where do we re- rewind that tape to? Uh, probably when I was a kid, um, just kind of where most people get into things: karate and judo and jiu-jitsu in england growing up so i'm from the southeast of england originally near dover or my hometown is actually where the channel tunnel is we know where that is that goes from england to france so that's where i grew up and i started i guess doing judo at a local army camp um the local army folks used to teach it there so that was fun and uh, probably inspired by you know late 70s early 80s kung fu movies and things lots of bruce lee jackie chan and probably a parallel development in that i went to an all boys school so was always getting into a lot of scraps and wasn't particularly good at scrapping, but learned how like not to lose too badly. <laughs> and then um, and then wanted to take up kind of judo or karate or something like that, just so that I could hit a bit harder or protect myself or protect the other kids from bullying. I seemed to get pulled into that role quite a lot when I was at school. And then I did mostly that and fencing. So I did European style fencing for a bunch of years as well, which I think also counts as martial art. So lots of sword play throughout my um, teens. And then I didn't really get into training seriously until... My early 20s, I moved to Scotland to go to university. And uh, there I started studying Aikido and got um, very, very deep into Aikido and, and studied for probably about 14 years. Um, oh. And with an instructor in Scotland that had spent many years in Japan with uh, one of the founder students um, by the name of Motohiro Saito, um, very famous in the Aikido world. And mm. he uh, he recommended me and sent letters of introduction to the Iwama Dojo. And after university in Scotland, I, did, I had four years there, I moved to Japan and I trained for two years at the uh, Iwama Dojo and other dojos in Tsuchida, uh, about 200, 300 miles north of Tokyo for a little while as a sotodeshi, so as an outside student, and did that um, for a couple of years and then came back 
had five years in London, during which time I was teaching and training Aikido still, and then trying out a bunch of other martial arts. Um, so I did some Chinese internal stuff, some Tai Chi, Bagua, some Filipino stuff, some Eskrima. Um, and it was there that I discovered Sistema and uh, after experiencing Sistema and a slight refractory period where I wasn't quite uh, willing to put down my other tools, uh, I was 100% um, in and I've been training that ever since. So pretty much mm. karate and judo and stuff as a kid and into my teens and then Aikido throughout my 20s and early 30s. And then for the last 15, 16 years, it's just all been Sistema. Wow. Now, anybody that knows anything about Aikido and Sistema knows that if you were to kind of chart in some way, if you were going to find some way to organize martial arts, mm -hmm. I think it would be pretty fair to say that no matter the methodology, you probably see Aikido and Sistema, if not as polar opposites, I mean, pretty, pretty far apart. And so I, I'm really intrigued. Aikido really grabbed you, it sounds like, in such a way... It, you went to Japan for because of Aikido, right? I mean, that's kind of yeah, how I correct. sounded. So yeah. you're, I mean, you were all in. Yeah, yeah, I had that. And uh, then something got you all out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, how'd that happen? I guess my drive to study Aikido was on a kind of wanting to study something that worked with refinement and efficiency. I was never going to be like the biggest guy out there or the fastest guy out there. So it just occurred to me that just trying to learn how to wrestle or box in as skilled a way as you can was still probably going to get your head kicked in by a very large guy in England at some point. So I think I was just looking for some more tools, um, some more kind of biomechanically refined tools to work with. And maybe on some level, I was also look, looking for some sort of structure to live by. You know, a lot of people, I think they get into very traditional, either Chinese or Japanese arts are doing so because they they're looking for some sort of meaning and purpose through their training i think and i kind of bought wholesale into the whole kind of um bushido hagakure uh, samurai mentality you know i learned japanese when i lived there and I, I studied very very hard and um did like a thousand sword cuts a day and all the things that you do in order to immerse yourself fully in that in that culture and those ideas and i really enjoyed it and i had a I had a wonderful time i don't regret a second of the time that I spent training Aikido, I met some wonderful friends, great people, got to do seminars in like Denmark and um, Scotland and Finland and Japan and all over the place. And so it was really, really great. It introduced me to a wider scope of people in the martial arts. Um, but I think there were a couple of kind of formative experiences while I was in Japan um, and especially actually while I was training Aikido when I was in Scotland, there was one experience where I was um, got into a fight with um, with a guy coming back from a night out in the town in Aberdeen, Northern Scotland, very cold, very dark late at night. Um, and a, a guy was kind of being abusive to the girl that I was walking with and we got, got into a scuffle um, and we started fighting and then he pulled a knife and, um, you know, in traditional martial arts, you do a lot of training and how to deal with knife stabs and things like that. But typically people line up nicely and do a, a nice, you know, straight thrust to the stomach and you practice your perfect wrist lock technique and they go down on the ground and you feel very good about yourself. But this didn't look, look like that at all. Um, there was a lot of scuffling. There was a lot of clinching. There's a lot of me just trying to keep the thing away from me. In the end, I smacked him in the neck, held him down and, um, and his two friends actually pulled him off and then begged me not to tell the police because he was on probation. So, <laughs> so I, I basically escaped that and realized that a lot of my techniques for all the time that I've been training, which wasn't all that much time at that point, I guess it was only about four or five years in Aikido, but all the techniques seemed to kind of go out the window. And I got, I got very adrenalized and I could feel the effects of stress and aggression, the stress hormones, everything raging through my body. And I realized that I just survived that encounter, right? I didn't um, dominate, I didn't win, I didn't prevail. I just survived it and it could have been a lot worse. And I think that stuck with me. And that was part of the reason why I kind of doubled down went to train Aikido at the source, thinking maybe my Aikido just wasn't good enough. And if I, if I studied really, really hard uh, in the place where it's hardest to study and get my black belt there and all that kind of stuff, then it would make me feel more confident in the ability of the system that I was using to, to prevail in a real situation. I mean, clearly self-defense wasn't the only reason why I was training, but Nobody, I mean, with some exceptions, I think if you, you you can do lots of things with fitness, you can do CrossFit, you can do yoga, you can do any number of other things. So if you're deciding to train martial arts as like a physical pastime, then probably self-defense figures somewhere into your view of what it's for, right? Um, and I think that doubling down in on that 
was my tactic to just sort of see how far I could go with it. And then I had a couple of other formative experiences with that that made me feel like maybe I needed to augment my Aikido. You know, I knew that I couldn't do anything if I got taken down to the ground by a BJJ guy or a Sambo wrestler or something like that. Um, I knew that my ability to deal with people with firearms or multiple attackers was very, very limited. Um, good boxers can hold you at range very, very easily if, if you haven't got the skills at dealing with that. And so I started to kind of augment my existing training, which was pretty solid in the Aikido world. You know, I got my black belt in in the uh at the at the place where aikido was essentially founded um or mm. passed down to so i had a good pedigree in terms of my aikido training and it was a lot better than most of the people when i came back and started teaching and training in london um there were a few people that were at that time i felt that i would go to and learn it was only when a friend of mine came back from japan and started teaching that i actually started training again i was teaching for a little while and he came back he was better than me and i started training at his class um but I, at the same time, I started to do all these things, the escrima, the stick fighting, the knife fighting, um, looking at the Chinese arts in a way to try to develop a stronger route or better footwork or, or ways of kind of augmenting what I felt were gaps in, in the system of Aikido in, in some ways. And I'm not denigrating Aikido in any way by saying this. Um, just that's the way that I felt um, in, in terms of my own ability and my own technique. And I think I always came up wanting. I, I've, I felt like I was putting a jigsaw puzzle together and the pieces didn't quite fit, you know? Um, mm. And then I, just one formative day, it was at a university that I was attending to do a postgraduate degree. I just saw this sign saying, um, learn Russian martial art, you know, um, real real stuff, no belts, no pajamas, no grades, no nonsense, you know, just go in there and we'll, we'll train you. And it was in the basement of a pub <laughs> on the, on the campus where, where we were. And it was taught by a, an English guy who had been to Russia a couple of times and uh, was an instructor in Sistema. But it, in retrospect, he wasn't amazingly good, but my experience of it was quite eye opening. And I, sh I showed up and there's all these guys. And first of all, they're on hardwood floors and they're throwing each other around doing, you know, shoulder throws, hip throws, um, back drop, take down, sacrifice throws, and they're just hitting the ground, but they're hitting it like cats. They're like, there's no big slam. There's no kind of big break fall where they slam the ground. They just seem to be able to not hurt themselves. And I'm looking at this thinking, somebody's going to die here, you know, <laughs> or at least break their neck or a leg or an ankle or something. Um, but they just seem to be extraordinarily soft in their movements. They could go from being, they could get punched very hard and kind of absorb it in a soft way without bracing up and they could get thrown and just hit the ground like a cat. Um, so that was very impressive to start with. And then the guy who was teaching actually had an Aikido background before he went to Sistema as well. And he asked me about what I'd trained before. And he's like, okay, come try and put a couple of joint locks on me. And, and I did. And I just kept ending up on my ass. Basically, every time I tried to touch him, I just ended up flat on the ground. And it wasn't that he was picking me up and throwing me or that he was locking me painfully to the ground. It was just a pure knowledge of biomechanics and how my body worked that just eluded me. It's like his level of understanding was so far above mine that it was like I was a toddler messing around with his dad. You know, <laughs> he just kept plonking me on my ass. And I'm like, what is going on here? And to be honest, it was a big kick in the ego, you know, after years of training martial arts and thinking yourself quite tasty. Um, I was like, I've got to go back to the drawing board. Um, you know, was, there's, there's something that I've really, really missed. And, uh, and I started training with them, but out of ego or, 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 you know, enjoying the feeling of being accomplished and not quite wanting to relinquish all of that. I kind of trained both side by side for a while. I wouldn't let go of Aikido. And, and for a few years, I was training Aikido mostly, and I would train Sistema like once a week. Uh, so I'd, I'd feel good three days a week. And then once a week, I'd get my ass handed to me by these Russians <laughs> and English guys. Um, and then... When I moved to the States in 2007, I tried to join, join an Aikido school here in North Carolina. Um, and I just didn't think the, the standard was that good to the school that I went to and I wasn't that impressed. And coincidentally, about a month after I moved here, um, the top guy outside of Russia in Sistema, Vladimir Vasiliev, came to Charlotte, North Carolina um, to do a seminar. Uh, like a two day seminar. So I signed up, went to that seminar. And then at that point I was like, okay, this is it. I'm, I'm all in for this. Once I met Vlad and worked with him one-to-one, -one, I was hundred percent convinced of the, the efficiency, the power, um, and the scope of Sistema, what, what it could do. It was so much more than just a martial art. And I didn't really realize what it was at the time. I was just thinking it was going to be another set of tools to put in my kit. Um, but I realized it was something entirely different. It was an operating system for making you do things better. And martial arts is just one of the things that you can do with it. So, uh, so at that point I quit Aikido and just started training Sistema full-time pretty much. And, and I've been doing that ever since. Wow. Wow. 
lots of lots of things to respond to there. Yeah, sorry, long answer to a short uh, question. No, no, it's it, <laughs> this is great because it gives us a lot of opportunities for places that we can go. Sure. Uh, the 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 short thing that I'll respond is that your I, I've heard a number of people talk about their experiences with Vlad, and hmm. I have not met him. I have not trained with him. I have not done any Systema training. But sure. what you're saying you experienced is exactly what I have heard others say that meeting him is uh, transformational. Yeah. If you, uh, their martial arts. Go ahead. Yeah, and I understand that that can sound a little cultish <laughs> when it, people it say that. Oh, I met this yeah. yoga guru, and then I, you know, it's my my world changed. Uh, and it's not that Vlad is very unassuming, and he doesn't like having the mantle of master instructor or anything like that. You know, I think he almost reluctantly got into teaching, just having left Russia, moved to um, Canada, married you know married a Russian but in Canada and stayed in Toronto and it, and it's his wife that's really built the business around him I think I think if it was his doing he'd still be teaching 20 guys in a basement you know it's it's his wife that's made it into a career for him sure. so he's he's a very unassuming guy he's very humble um but he just has spectacular skill and he's just one of those people I mean sometimes you meet them in different walks of life outside martial arts as well that are just entirely interested in um authentic interactions right he gives you his undivided attention you feel like he's really trying to listen to what you're saying and work with you as a person for what you need. And at the same time, he just has this incredible awareness and capacity for understanding what, how you move, how you breathe, uh, how you walk. <laughs> he can tell most things about you just by watching you walk across a room. Mm. And some of that's from his systemic training. Some of that's from his military training. He was, you know, special operations for a bunch of years and, and was trained to notice things about people. Um, so uh, I've come across people who aren't martial artists, but are military like that. I've worked with, you know, a couple of Navy SEALs here and special ops, Coast Guard guys and army guys who have that same level of situational awareness. You know, they can size you up in seconds. Um, but, um, but the combination of, that ability, I think, that that lurking awareness and dangerousness with this personality that's really quite humble and kind and generous. And when you put the two of them together, it's quite it's quite an interesting package. You don't see it a lot of places in martial arts, in my experience. Usually when somebody has that level of skill, a, a certain level of arrogance comes with it, right? They, they know that they're the best and and they're an air of superiority or something comes with it. But you don't get that with Vladimir at all. It's very disarming. Hmm. Interesting. I, I hope I, I get to meet him. Yeah, I do. The, the other piece, mm. and, and I think this is where I want to I want to go for now. You talked about that exchange with the knife. Yeah. And it was really clear that that unsettled you. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And I would mm, sorry. Go, go ahead. Yeah, no, when you go. <laughs> uh, I, I would imagine that regardless of that exchange, you probably would have ended up in Japan. You were you were on track, right? You were into Aikido pretty deep and going to Japan and learning Japanese and, and training there seems like the next logical step. But what, what I'm suspecting based on how your training went when you came back mm. was that you, part of you in Japan was looking for that answer that you didn't have during that knife exchange. What was the missing piece there? And you didn't find it. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it's fair to say. And I think I was looking in the wrong places for it. Um, mm -hmm. I think some people just look at a problem like that and just think, I want to solve it by becoming faster and stronger and the best at what I do. And then I have so much confidence in my ability that that will overshadow this nagging voice that says, you know what, you're still very vulnerable and anybody could stab you, you know, <laughs> um, kind of work in that way. Some people... <sighs> go the other route and they just go into full personal protection mode and carry knives and guns on them at all times so that they feel prepped for everything. Right. So that's another way that people put kind of a shell of courage and confidence around the fear that's on the inside. That's the way that I would term it. Um, and I think in some ways that that's what I was doing. There was, there was still some part of me that was not acknowledging the fear that was on the inside and is just kind of blustering and putting a mask on the outside and getting very skilled in, in some very specific ways, but never really addressing that internal state of being like, I'm if if things really go down here and knives come out and things are going towards me, I can't I can't stay calm in this situation or I can't stay calm enough to deploy these skills that I'm so proud of. Um, and nothing in my training up until I started Sistema 
gave me any reasonable tools for working with that. And I still haven't really seen, to be honest, in, in most martial arts, a, a direct solution to that problem outside of Sistema. Um, and Sistema has pr provided a different answer, which is you have to start with your nervous system first. You have to start with acknowledging the fear that you have, acknowledging yeah. like the pride and the overconfidence that you might have, um, acknowledging where you're strong, where you're weak, and then starting from that very basic idea of like under, understanding and knowing yourself. And then once you know your strengths and limitations, you can start to kind of craft that and build something on top of it, whether it's physical skill, whether it's um, psychological skill, whatever it's going to be. But you have to start from that basis of knowing yourself. Otherwise, everything that you do is layered upon a shaky foundation. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. And, and, you know, we have people listening from all different styles all over the world and most importantly, different reasons for training. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are people out there. I, so I'm going to add a third category to the, the kind of duality that you put forward. People mm -hmm. who either don't want to worry about it or don't think it's a, a significant risk. And depending on where you are and the life you live, that may be true. Right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. We, we all, we all train for different reasons. And, and, uh, one of the things longtime listeners know is that I, I absolutely do not judge. I mean, you're, you're whatever your reasons for training, I'm just happy you're training. I, I sure. really couldn't care less. Yeah. But there are, there are some schools out there and it's, it's, um, Sistema may codify this better. And I suspect that they do, mm -hmm. but we're talking about stress and, and the nervous system and mm -hmm. the concepts there. I mean, they're not, I, they're not unique to Sistema. No, I wouldn't, not, say, I wouldn't say they're yeah. unique, but like um, a lot of styles have different solutions to them and there's solutions that can work in some situations. Sure. Um, and I think there are other paths to this. I mean, a very simple path to one, one's a very simple path to not worrying about individual kind of monkey fighting, like person to person conflict that doesn't involve multiple attackers or weapons mm. or anything deeply life threatening, right? It's basically posturing. Right. It's, it's a kind of a ritualized fighting that most of us should probably grow out of by the time we're 20, right? <laughs> I haven't really had a fight like <laughs> this for 20 years. Yeah, exactly. No, some don't, some do. Um, but one solution to that is just to, you know, to train something like boxing um, or MMA for a long period of time, get in the ring, uh, get clobbered a bunch of times and figure out where you're vulnerable, where you're not, um, have a very strong understanding of, of how much punishment you can take, um, what the capacity for injury is, how strong you really are, whether or not you can hit people, whether or not you really can control people. Um, and in doing so, you just kind of test it by fire and then your psyche will stabilize at the place where you currently know yourself to be, right? So one mm. way to do it is kind of that way um, to go in kind of the hard way for one-to-one -one fighting. And, and you will find out a lot about yourself that way. And, I, and I, th I think that's one way of kind of tempering your nervous system to an extent. The problem comes when you have more complex situations than that. And so if you're thinking about martial arts as a self-defense system, then you're thinking about the potential for armed attackers, for um, sucker punches, for people attacking you from behind, using clothing, you know, using uh, environments using <laughs> smashing your head off a wall or a car or something like that. And there's nothing in particular with, within a lot of one-to-one -one focused styles that, that prepares you for that. Um, there's some like Krav Maga that will put you in certain situations and then practice kind of busting out of those with maximum aggression and people wearing pads so that you can kind of unleash as hard as you can. And again, that that's another potential solution to it. I'm not saying that, um, Sistema has the monopoly on thinking about fear control and the nervous system and, and stress and how that affects fighting. There's, there's lots and lots of different ways. And, and some styles go quite deep on breathing as well and on um, controlling your mind state as you work in. You know, karate has the whole mushing concept and um, lots of other, even in high level Brazilian Jiu Jitsu now, you see a lot of the top instructors and the Gracies and the Machados talking about breathing and the importance of it, which you didn't hear a lot of years ago. Mm. Um, so I think every style has its or a lot of styles have an approach to it. But for me, it wasn't as systematic. It was almost like, well, learn all these physical skills first. And when this becomes a problem, you know, we'll, we, we might address sure. that problem. But, but trust Absolutely. us, if you learn how to do a really good punch or an armbar, you'll probably be okay. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily true. It depends on the kinds of situations you find yourself in. And like you said, it's, it's different horses for different courses, right? If you, if you live in a comparatively safe place, you might never feel like you need to learn any kind of self-defense. And you live in a place where the 
the environment is such that most of the violence is fairly controlled and ritualized. Like if you're just having scraps at a school or you're just, you know, in a, you know, a gated community where everybody plays nice, then you're probably okay. But if you're somewhere else or you travel to less desirable parts of the world where kind of all bets are off, then if you're really consider seriously considering your martial art as a self-defense system, you have to start taking these things into account. Like, would I be able to survive in this environment? Would I be able to keep calm enough to deploy any skills in this environment? Does that make sense? And Sistema for it me, does. it was the first one where, where they sort of said from the very beginning, you know, your skills will be useless unless you consider what's going on with your nervous system and your psyche. You have to train that every bit as much as you do your body and your skills and your techniques of wrestling and striking and ground fighting or whatever it's going to be. So it's, I, I was fascinated by this idea of giving you a, a, a direct concrete series of practices that actually build that independently of fighting experience. Mm. Yeah. And I think that the, that that's the key, mm. you know, any, as you said, Sistema doesn't have the monopoly on this concept, but what my understanding of Sistema and, and Krav Maga and, and certainly other schools, right. It's we're in 2020, it's really hard to generalize based on style anymore. Sure. Because yeah. so many people have cross trained and brought concepts in from other things. Yeah, absolutely. But the path to surviving a fight, really does need to go through the concept of dealing with your adrenaline and, and nervous system and, and fight or flight and, and that whole bucket of stuff. It, it's got to sure. be addressed at some point and whether it's day one in a Sistema class or, yeah. you know, eight years in, in a karate class, it, it's sure. doesn't really matter to me as long as people are getting what they, what they want and they need out of their training. But at some point, Ideally, you go through that, you figure it out because as you said, without it, what do you do? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And as you said, also people, not everybody trains for the same reason. So it can be, it might be that you're studying Aikido or Karate in the same way that somebody studies archery. You know, you're not planning on killing anybody with bows and arrows tomorrow, <laughs> but you just, you get benefit from the peace of mind, the focus. There's lots of benefits to martial arts besides self-defense. Um, and it's probably worth saying at this point that for me now, um, at my age and my stage of development, self-defense is not my primary reason for continuing to train Sistema. It's like a lot of people who come into Sistema start with that. Um, and then once they reach a certain level of understanding or development, they, they may continue with that, or they may start to focus a little bit more on the ancillary benefits, the other things that um, Sistema does for you, more, most specifically in terms of health and um, emotional control and your ability to connect with people and understand people better. Um, so it has a, understanding yourself has a lot of deeper ramifications for how you interact with people in the world, whether it's like the, the jerk at work or the, you know, or um, talking, you know, arguing with your wife without, without it becoming, you know, nasty or snipey or something like that, you know, being able to keep yourself on an emotional low boil and keeping a wide view, seeing the whole situation, wherever you are, that to me is much more important. And a lot of the people that train under me and with me now, you know, we have CEOs, we have people who run companies, we have people who are, you know, in the high stress jobs and environments like police or EMT stuff like that um, and they cite their main reason for training is not that they want to be you know Russian super soldiers or something like that right <laughs> their, their goal for training is that it, it's the more they train the calmer they become in high stress situations and that has its own benefits quite apart from self-defense so even though we started out on this tack and I think probably because that's the tack that I started on right I was kind of obsessed with learning how to defend myself properly it's no longer really my chief motivation so it's um so I guess it was the road in but it's not the road forward for me makes sense mm. I want to go back to one other point and I think this is a significant point and it, it might be something that is uh, enlightening or at least worth considering for people listening hmm. and that is you talked about training Aikido and Sistema kind of at the same time. Yeah. And just the, the, the words you used, or at least the, my, my, the way I took them was sort of that your head said, it's time to leave Aikido, but your heart wouldn't let you do that as quickly. That there was, there was an, enough of an emotional tie there that it took you some time to extract yourself. Did I, did I pick up on that right? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's um, 
a division between the head and the heart. It wasn't that logically okay. I thought I should do Sistema, and but I felt like I wanted to stay with Aikido because I was still in love with it. I don't. Mm. I don't think it was. Um, I don't think that's quite the division. I think it's more that my reasons for training had changed. Um, mm. I I had developed and changed as a person in that time training, and Aikido was no longer the tool that was going to get me to the next stage in my development, if that makes sense. Um, but does. the reason why I was hanging on to it was because what it did was make me feel confident, make me feel uh, accomplished, make me feel like I'd, I'd worked really hard for something and gone to Japan and got the, you know, got the achievement and that I could show that to people. Right. And one of the things that Sistema does is, to, is kind of hold up a mirror and show you how much of your daily interactions and decisions kind of often stem from like from ego or pride or a need to show off to people like in some way. And, and I think the combination of starting Sistema and having that kind of being hit with the humility stick right? <laughs> and, and being forced to take a really good hard look at myself and on where my motivations were coming from and the realization that the main reason that I was still training Aikido at that point was because it made me feel fluffed up, made me feel better, right? It wasn't because I wanted to learn more Aikido. It's because I wanted to show people Aikido that I could do, right? Um, and I realized that there was a mismatch there. There was like a, a dissonance that wasn't sustainable. I, I should say that I know some people who have managed to train Aikido and Sistema concurrently for many years. They do it fine, you know, when they put the Hakama on their, their Aikidoka and when they take it off and put their jeans and t-shirt on their, their Sistema practitioners, you know. So some people are very good. They can change clothes and then they can change styles and they can do it. But I think for me, I felt like Aikido was doing what was doing the wrong thing for me. I think for other people, it could be really helping them. It could be helping them feel stronger and helping them train and even become more focused and learn more things. And if that was my mindset at the time, I would have kept going and still be training Aikido now. And, and I still love Aikido. I still love to see people practicing it. It's a, it's a beautiful style and it has a lot of benefit. And if my kids decide they want to study Aikido, I'll be more than happy to take them to classes or train them myself or whatever it's going to be. But um, I think the things that I was looking for became different. And I felt if I kept training Aikido, it might hold back my development in Sistema. Um, mm. more than anything else. And I was so committed to to becoming not more skilled in Sistema, but getting more understanding of myself through Sistema that I think having one foot out and one foot in would have been detrimental to me. Uh, and I needed to kind of make a clean break so that I could um, get off the ego train a little bit. Mm. And this is, this is one of the reasons that I like to define myself as a martial artist, mm. because there are times when karate is front and center for me. There are times when Taekwondo or Kempo or kickboxing or, sure. you know, any other number of things could be what I need and have the opportunity to train yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. And if I define myself as a martial artist, rather than I'm a karate guy, I'm in Aikidoka, sure. yeah. it becomes easier. I don't have to wrestle with that identity. Yeah. And so many people do. I, I've, I've had conversations with people, um, somebody local talking to me about their, their children being so close to black belts in a particular style and the school closed and mm -hmm. what do they do? And, and I really want them to get their black belt. Yeah. Let's, let's focus on the priorities. Yeah. Why is the black belt the priority? Mm. You know, why is training not the priority? Why is getting better? Not the priority. Yeah. Yeah. Th there's something to be said there as well in the, in the idea of training something for extrinsic rewards versus intrinsic ones. I think, mm. to be honest, you can train more or less anything. You can train Taekwondo, you can train Karate, you can train Jiu-Jitsu, you can box or even be an MMA fighter and do it. It's possible to train that for intrinsic rewards, right? You're training to try, to try and be the warrior, to, to make yourself stronger on the inside and on the outside, you know, to, um, to, to learn life lessons that you can apply elsewhere. And it's entirely possible to do that. But I, I think sometimes the, the structure of some styles encourages extrinsic reward instead. It's like, you're not training to be the best blue belt or brown belt you can be. You're training to get the next belt. Right. And, and that's, that's the thing that's important. And, and with kids, you can understand it because that's where the whole belt, belt system came from. Right. It was never there in karate before they started teaching it to kids. Um, and then that kind of migrated its way to adults as the idea is that you have to give kids like a, a benchmark or some, 
some uh, some hope that they're doing it towards something and they're very goal oriented in that way and so if you give them colored belts to stepping stone between then maybe they'll go the distance and mm. show kind of perseverance and do all the things they need to 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 attain that black belt and then by the time they get there they'll have learned a whole bunch of valuable lessons that maybe they wouldn't have done if you just kept them in a white belt and said train like that for 10 or 15 years oh, trust me it's going to be good you know mm. um so and that was another thing that appealed to me i think um maybe it was partly a reaction to the kind of the training that i had in japan as well which was which was excellent but it was it was very traditional so showing up as a new sotodeshi at the dojo you know you had to scuttle around and clean the mats first after after everybody had left and there were certain cloths that you could use and certain pieces of the you know the kamiza the shrine that was on the wall that you could clean but only the upper students could clean the upper ones everybody lines up in order of you know, <laughs> of their belt and their level, their attainment level. And there's a strict hierarchy to it uh, that, that I guess can serve a purpose. But after a certain point, you're like, is, is this is this really serving the needs of the students coming up and through and getting valuable information? Or is it making sometimes the people that are further up just feel better about themselves, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I realized that I was becoming part of that hierarchy in it. And sometimes that could do certain things. So I, I think extrinsic rewards can be can be distracting sometimes and the complete absence of them in Sistema. No, we, we literally don't have any belts at all. There are no grades and, and not everybody becomes an instructor. There are people that train for 20 years and they're happy to remain practitioners. Like being an instructor, isn't a badge of honor or a merit badge in, in Sistema is you just, you become an instructor because you have an ability to teach as well as to do. Right. So it's, it's, it's a different thing. Um, it's a bit like somebody being promoted to a manager just because they've been at the company mm. for a long time. You know, it's like some, <laughs> some people have no business managing, but they just get put in those positions. I right. think sometimes in martial arts, some people have no business teaching. They're really good martial artists, but they're not good teachers, you know, um, and vice versa, you, you know, so are like you some, familiar with the Peter principle? Sagan? The Peter principle? Uh, I've heard of it, but it, it's, a, it's yeah. a, you know, I'm going to, I might mess it up a little bit, but it's this idea that in corporate setting, you're promoted to the point of, you're promoted one step beyond your competency, essentially. Like, hey, you do okay. this job really, really well, so yeah. we're going to promote you. Okay. And if you stink, <laughs> you stay there. Yeah. Does that come from and, the Peter in office space? Is that where it comes from? I, it's older movie. than that. Okay. <laughs> I, I first heard it in like 2001. Right. It's going, it's going back. Right. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought maybe it referred to the uh, Peter in the, the office space movie. It, Cause he it could, yeah, he's just checked out. He's not shown up to work and they promote him because they think his management material. You know, right. that's really funny. <laughs> but I think it happens in martial arts settings too. Just as you're saying, you know, if somebody has the, the material at such and such a level mastered, they are promoted and expected to remain there until they, they get it. And so you're, you're kind of always behind the yeah. eight ball in yeah. a sense, trying to, trying to move forward. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I've spoken both for and against rank at various times on this show. It's, it's not a, a clean cut no. subject as far as I'm concerned. So yeah. the, the, the question, and I asked this half sarcastically mm. without belts, how do you know who's good? Yeah, it's basically you you demonstrate how good you are with your, in, your inherent attributes, right? It doesn't matter what kind of belt you're wearing. If you can't um, absorb a punch, if you can't deliver a heavy punch with minimal effort, if you can't um, ground fight and hold your own, uh, if you can't move against somebody swiping at you with a knife without panicking or tensing up or flinching, then you show your ability right, or your lack of it just in, in the doing of everything. So in, in Sistema, kind of the, the proof is in the pudding. It doesn't matter what people tell you about what they understand about biomechanics or how, what they saw last night in the MMA fight. And they're like, oh, I would have done this or I would totally would have armbarred that guy, right? <laughs> you, get armchair, you get armchair quarterbacks like this in, yeah. in all martial arts. But in oh, Sistema, it. it sorts itself out very quickly because once you start rolling together, you realize that it's you know, it doesn't matter. And uh, I, again, that's not unique to Sistema. I've seen that in BJJ as well. You know, somebody can talk a big game and maybe they got their belt at another school or something. And then when they go into free grappling or something, they just get owned immediately. And then, <laughs> and then you, and then you know what level they're at, you know, they're not really a, a blue belt. I mean, the example that I'll give actually is that when I came after Japan and after moving back to London and training there and teaching there for five years, I moved to North Carolina and went to a, a, an Aikido school and the, the 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 lead guy was pretty good. I thought he was a good standard, and he was apparently in like a fourth dan, and and he had a few like third duns and other people working underneath him. And um, and when I joined the school, I explained my situation. I'm like, hey, I've just moved here to the area, and 
I'm, I trained in Japan. I trained over here. I was at the Iwama Dojo and like, I got my knee done when I was there, right? Second time. And he's like, okay, cool. He goes, but um, you're not part of our organization. So you're going to have to wear the white belt, right? When you come in. Um, when you, so you, you know, just wear the gi and the white belt. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. And so I left the hug at home, left all that stuff that I've been wearing for years. And I showed up and started training. And then the first class I'm there and I line up at the, you know, the low end of the dojo with all the white, with the white belts. And, um, and I start training and I get paired up with a couple of his black belts and things. And when I'm gripping them, when I'm holding them for the beginning of the technique, right, you just grasp them. A lot of them couldn't move. They just couldn't, they were rooted to the spot. Like my grip was such after mm. thousands of sword cuts and traditional training in Japan that they were just stuck and that they couldn't start their technique. And, and I, I, eventually I eased up and let them go a little bit. But if I really wanted to pull on the juice, they, they couldn't move. And then when the, when it was flipped, they were trying to give me trouble and like gripping me really hard and working all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was pretty easy for me to fling most of them around, you know, that whole thing. So we went through that whole training session. I didn't really say very much. We just trained. Um, and then at the end of the class, the, the instructor came up and he goes, yeah, you can go ahead and wear your, how come my next class, right? <laughs> Basically <laughs> at the end of it. And then in the next class, the funniest thing happened was, um, that I actually, it wasn't the next class. I, I like the next class I showed up and I wore the white belt again. And I sat more or less in the middle of the room, like higher up than the kids that were wearing white belts, but lower down than pretty much everybody else, all the other adults, right? Who were wearing how come on things. And what happened in that second class was that <laughs> all the black belts started filtering in sitting to the, uh, to the left of me. Right? <laughs> so you had like a half empty dojo and all these people squashed to the left of where I was, apart from one black belt guy who scowled at me and sat the other side, you know, but just, so just in one session, they figured out what the pecking order was. And it was the end of that session that the instructor said, yeah, you should just go ahead and wear your hakama next class. So it, it didn't matter in some senses, which organization I was from or, you know, where we'd learned or what pieces of paper we had. It was clear from the ability once we were there, what skill I didn't, didn't have. Right. And so I, I give that as an example, not to, you know, blow my own trumpet, but just to say, I think it should probably always be like that in some ways. And, and like you say, it's not that clear cut because with kids, it's, it's hard for them to have motivation sometimes intrinsically. And that's why systemic kids classes aren't really that much of a, you know, a runaway success in the few places that people have tried them. It's, it, it demands a lot of attention, a lot of focus, a lot of perseverance and to no immediate gratifying end. You know what I mean? So it's, it's it, they can be really fun and all that kind of stuff, but they're not getting that little reward of like, I got to this place and here's where I'm going. So it can be di very difficult to train kids without extrinsic rewards. I'll, I'll grant you that. But with adults, you, you could make the argument that some people do better with some extrinsic reward and some don't. But most of the research, when you look into this in behavioral science and psychology shows that people only work for extrinsic rewards up to a point. And at the end, at the end of the day, you have to have an intrinsic reward you know, if you're going to kind of develop meaning in what you're doing, right? So th there's definitely arguments on both sides of this one, but I, th I think I come down on the side of it would be better if you were, even if you are a, a style that has belts, like maybe to have fewer of them, you know, like three belts, you've got like a beginner one, uh, I'm learning belt and a, I'm at a level where I could teach belt or something, right? And then wh wherever you are on that continuum, you're just working hard at being the best beginner you can be or the best intermediate student you can be or the best instructor you can be, right? Rather than constantly having your eye on the prize you know i, I agree mm -hmm. and, and i've i've made the prediction that in the next 20 years belts will will change they'll have to because mm. we have and and this is not meant as disrespectful to people that are, are listening that might be in this boat but I, I started training in the early 80s and at that time in order to you know let's use the karate model where you have 10 degrees of black belt mm. you know there would be one tenth degree black belt per style usually in the world, yeah. Uh, that person would be really old. They probably couldn't train that hard anymore yeah, because they were really old. Mm -hmm. And ninth degrees and even eighth degrees were still pretty old. And I, I don't mean old for, you know, to, to me as, as a kid, I mean, you know, your 10th degrees would be in their 80s and their the eighth and ninths would be in their maybe late sixties, early seventies, you know, it was, it was sure. a lifetime yeah, it of took training time to, get there, right? <laughs> to, to get there. Yeah. And now there are people in their twenties who are fourth, fifth, sixth degree black belts. Sure. Yeah. There's not a lot of room left. So what, what do you do? Yeah. Are it's we going to, are we going to add more, more belts? Are we going to add more stripes? You know, are we, yeah, there are styles that are adding 11, 12, uh, 15 degrees yeah. to black belt. Mm -hmm. And so at some point that gets watered down enough, I'm not saying it is now, but if it follows that trajectory, it gets watered down enough that eventually people say, well, that doesn't have value anymore. 
Yeah, it can, it can be demotivating to the other people who have worked for like 30 years for their sixth down or something. Do you know what I mean? If they see <laughs> if they see a 16 year old who's been given one, uh, it can be a bit demotivating for those people. I think so. I think I think there are some inherent problems with um, with belts and gradings for adults at least. Um, but yeah, it's and again, it's not chief among my concerns. I mean, it certainly makes it easier to market a martial art when you tell them when you tell somebody how long they can expect to train mm. before they get good. Like that's one of the questions that people come in to system with. They're like, how long, how long do I have to do this before I can, you know, kick ass? I could be, I can kick somebody's ass. <laughs> and it's always, you know, it's, it's a silly question because you have, it, it depends on the context, depends how much skill they come in with. It depends how much time they plan on training, you know, and the, the mindset they're going to apply, you know, it's not just a question of putting in X number of hours and then you're guaranteed this amount of ability, you know, it's a, you wouldn't say that of somebody if they were learning violin or piano or something, right? <laughs> it's so it's kind of, it's a silly question, but at least in martial arts where you have extrinsic rewards, you can say, well, typically it takes people a minimum of, I know what, three years to get to yellow belt or, you know, six years to get to brown belt and like 10 years to get to black belt or something. You can give people kind of waypoints sure. and then that helps them pace themselves in their training. So it, it is a useful device for sales and marketing, definitely. And it, and it helps get people to start and and to an extent to stay with you for a little bit. But I'm not convinced of its, um, of its efficiency or inherent worth in, in mm. building better, stronger martial artists. Let's put it that way. So when, when you were talking about answering that question, people come in and how long before I can kick ass. Yeah. And I was imagining, well, day one, but just the, the, the person whose ass you can kick changes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So on day one, you can probably beat up a five-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that led me to, and in the early, so bear with me, maybe this is a new standard for martial arts. Uh, listeners, especially if you're new, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> in the early days of Facebook, there were a lot of apps and longtime Facebook users will remember this time when you would install these applications within Facebook. And one of them was, how many five-year-olds can you take in a fight? <laughs> and it would ask you three to five questions. Right. And it would give you this ridiculous number, like you could beat up 47 five-year-olds in a fight. <laughs> and so what if that was the new standard? How many small children, you know, massing upon you, could you defend yourself against? <laughs> it is as valid a standard i think is anything else and it's it's silly uh and and meant to be silly because rank is silly yeah it, it, it can be I, I wouldn't i wouldn't go do, that do it, that far to assert that but but actually there's there is some interesting truth hidden hidden within that with that silly metric right if you just translated that to um you know average competent people you know just a average street fighter about your same size or build running, running around the answer to how many people could you beat up in a fight is maybe one and almost never two right for most people if they're untrained and for a lot of pe people training a lot of martial arts that number changes to definitely one but still never two or three right there is there is a definite there's a difference between understanding what it is to square off against one person and a, attempting to fight off two or three people who really want to subdue you. It's a, it's, a, it's a different concept. So that's actually, so when you were talking about how do we know when, when somebody is good, um, there are a lot of people that come into Sistema and most people I would say come into Sistema with a background in other things. So some of them come in having wrestled or done jujitsu or done Aikido or done you know, Eskrima, Kali or Karate or something else. So they come with kind of a preloaded, um, base set of skills. Um, and it's interesting. One of the things that we watch is not how good are you at fighting one person, but what happens if we add a second person or a third person or mm. somebody with a weapon. Um, and that's when you really start to see the kind of things that we measure as skill and system. So, I mean, it doesn't really mean anything to say how good a fighter is he, uh, outside of the context of, you know, um, you know, pound for pound matchups in sport fighting and things like that. It, it, it means something in some contexts, but uh, when you say good, good at what? What are you training for? In some ways, Sistema, the training method in self-defense is a bit like spread betting. You know, we train in order to make our psyche stable and resilient to ups and downs and adrenalization. And we train to be able to calm ourselves down if we get sucker punched or hit. We train our bodies to be able to take a lot of impact, you know, getting punched with real fists and hit with real sticks, you know, unpadded, those kinds of things. Um, we train to adapt in wrestling and grappling situations. Um, you know, you can employ 
techniques, but your basal ability is your ability to stay calm and find solutions in those things. And then we train with a, a wide variety of different things like weapons and multiple attackers and stuff like that. So you're kind of spread betting. Once you've got your foundation, you're like, I want to get at least competent in all of these things, just in case I get into a fight in an alley against three guys. And I've got, you know, I have a wall to deal with. I have three guys to deal with. One of them's armed. At least I want to be able to survive against these people. So we're kind of spread betting and getting competent in all those things rather than be like, I want to be so good at boxing or so good at grappling that oh, anybody that's in front of me, I'm pretty sure I can knock them out or I'm pretty sure I could choke them out. Right. So in some ways, that's kind of putting all your eggs in the one basket and hoping that the other guy. <laughs> you know, wants to grapple or wants to box or that you're so good at it, you'll get that guy. But it's kind of, it's ignoring all of these other potential situations. So from a self-defense perspective, Systema spread bets a lot like that way. Um, but another way in which it spread bets is that we want to make sure that everything that we do in Systema is building us physically and psychologically, that we're not going to practice methodologies, um, mindsets or techniques that make us more likely to get into fights and more likely to miss the cues that enable us to get out of fights, right. Um, to mm. see things coming so that we don't that blunder sense. into danger because you know, the expression is if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? If you're really good at knocking people out, then at the first sign of an altercation, you'll probably square up, jerk your jaw out and be like, all right, let's do this. Cause if push comes to shove, I can knock you out. Right. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> if you understand the parameters of violence and how quickly it goes South, you're more likely to look for a loophole and a way to kind of talk the guy down, buy him a drink, you know, make him feel like it was his idea, whatever it's going to be, um, and be a little bit more clever about it and sustainable. And then that way you can continue doing your martial art until you're 70 or 80, whereas some get burned out through the training methodologies when they're like 30 or 40, you know, as you said, like a lot of the, you know, older 10th downs and things like Saito Sensei in Japan, he would, he'd be amazing on the mat. And then as soon as he got off the mat, he would be like limping and hobbling you know, and he had trouble <laughs> getting up and down from his knees, which is a tough thing when you live in Japan um, and all that kind of stuff. And, and he wasn't crazy old, you know, he was in his early seventies and, um, and that's significant. And I've seen people in a lot of martial arts with like busted up knees and busted up shoulders and things. And they, they can't play with their kids. Right. And they can't, they can't do certain other things because they've, they've punished themselves as much as they've punished their opponents over the years. So we, we kind of, one of the precepts of Sistema is non-destruction of yourself, right? In Aikido, they talk about just use the amount of force that you need to subdue your opponent and be very kind and loving. It's like, we don't quite do that. We still <laughs> snap things and beat people and do, or do all those kinds of things. But we want to make sure that those the techniques we're using physically or psychologically don't harm us in the long term. We, we want to make sure that it's a sustainable practice that we can do you know, into our old age. Makes sense. Absolutely. I want to contrast Aikido and, and Sistema just personally, just a, a little bit more, sure. because w let's face it, we might have a handful of people listening who have trained Sistema. The majority of people listening have never done any Sistema, sure. but Aikido is probably something that they can relate to a little bit more. Sure. And here we also have this um, paradox, isn't the right word, but this contrast for you and the thing that you started with sort of, and the thing that you are now doing. Yeah. So I'm going to ask the question in kind of two different ways. Okay. What did your Aikido experience help you with as you stepped into Sistema? And what did it, what was more difficult? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think as with most people, it gave me at least a vocabulary to be working with. It gave me an understanding of um, balance, an understanding of posture, um, some understanding of biomechanics and how to move people around in terms of balance and centers of mass and all of those kinds of things that you, you'll learn those from judo and wrestling and other styles too, as, as well that way. Um, it gave me a repertoire of very specific techniques and joint locks, you know, Aikido can know at least 50 ways to snap your arm off, you know? <laughs> so there's, there's that coming into it straight yes. away. And, and sometimes those things will just manifest themselves in my system of practice, right? If something falls into your lap, whether it's like a, you know, a Kotegashi wrist lock or a, or a left hook, then you're probably going to take it. If you've trained it many times in the past, it will just appear. Right. But, um, so it, it gave me kind of a vocabulary for understanding what a martial art is. And it also, at least the way that I trained it traditionally um, with like lots of weapons, uh, doing a thousand sword cuts every day and trying to understand the, the relationship between moving with an object and moving empty handed and moving another person around. Um, those traditional training methods, um, repetitive but precise, um, built a certain kind of dexterity and coordination to my body that made it easier, I think, for me to at least start making other movements. Um, 
so and it also i think the emphasis of aikido in not colliding with your opponent right not crashing and smashing like some other styles use the crash and smash to really good effect like a, a lot of filipino styles will do that krav maga will do that you know some karate styles are very kind of forward pressing in that way and e even the brawling boxing styles do the same thing right um Aikido explicitly avoids that. The, the idea is to move sideways to or around or behind your opponent or just kind of slip the, the, the angle of attack so that you're never directly opposing force. That's kind of the, um, the ideal in Aikido. And I think training that for many, many years gave me an eye to seeing where those lines might be, right? How at least understanding where the center line is, where the attack could come from and treating the opponent like a dangerous ball of stuff from which, you know, a foot or a fist could emerge rather than looking for an individual punch or a kick. Um, so it definitely, and distance and timing, there's a, there's a lot that comes from that um, just as there is from training a lot of other martial arts. Where it, where it hindered me is that um, like many martial arts, it, it depends on the specific positionality um, of stance and your position relative to the other person. And some techniques only work if you're in a perfect position relative to the other person in terms of footwork, right? Um, whether it's throws or joint locks or takedowns or where it's gonna be. So that, that rigidity and that moving and then settling into a stance um, has a downside in Sistema because we, we have no stances in Sistema. Like all of the movement is natural and of the way that you would probably move when you were walking albeit like you walk sideways and backwards and forwards in a fight, not just forwards, right? Um, so yeah, the analogy we use is that you fight like you walk in Sistema and you walk like you fight, you know? So it's mm. it, that held me up for a long time. And I, I was so obsessed with drawing power from my hips and turning my hips into every strike or every throw or whatever it's going to be, that it became very hard for me to relax my hips at all. Um, and that makes you very, very vulnerable to getting punched, frankly. <laughs> if you hold your hips very, very tight and in a, in a hard stance, um, it can be easy to injure the abdomen and injure the back for somebody that knows what they're doing with striking. So it's, um, and, you, and planting your legs too, you come up against a good kickboxer or a Muay Thai guy, they'll just, you know, if you hold a solid stance in front of them, you know, you're not moving, they'll just drill that IT band and you'll go down <laughs> in a heap like, immediately, yes. right? So, um, yeah. so it's, I think that my idea of, how to generate power was molded by Aikido in some useful ways, but it also led me down some blind alleys. There were some ways in which um, I, I was seeking power in places where I wasn't going to realistically find it in a fight. And, um, and Sistema showed me some of the ways in which it could be useful and some of the ways in which it isn't useful. So it's, it's hard to explain until you get into the details of it, but that's the problem with Sistema is that it's so, amorphous right it has no fixed stances it has technically no fixed techniques although there are some that kind of recur quite a lot um so what you're really doing is trying to remove things from your body really you're trying to remove tendencies rather than add things on add techniques mm. you're trying to remove the tendency to flinch you're trying to remove the tendency to buckle to lean away and to do things that kind of bleed by mechanical power away from your body and then once you understand those things then you can start to build your attacks, build your defenses, and then even attacks and defenses that you see other people doing. You know, I can roll with a BJJ guy and he can get behind me or, you know, slip on some sort of lock. And I'm like, oh, that was interesting. And then 10 minutes later, I can use it back on him. You know, it, it makes you very, <laughs> because you understand what it is and what it does. You don't have to learn it step by step. You understand the principle of what he was trying to do. You know, so it's, it's, it's very, it, it gives you an operating system that makes it easier to absorb other things. But the downside is, is that you come in with your own operating system. You have to kind of unlearn at least a little bit of that first, or at least put your skills on the back burner for a while and while you learn this new way of thinking and moving and doing. And then later the skills will reassert themselves anyway. You know, So yeah, it, it both helps and hinders. I get it. I get it. Let's look into the future. You know, you got to magic crystal ball and you're able to look out a few years and, and say, you know, this is where I'm going to be. Where, where would you hope you were going to be? Think about your goals. Think about what the future may hold. What do you want to happen as it relates to your martial arts? Um, I mean, for me personally, it's just to keep training as a, as a practitioner to deepen my understanding of myself and um, to pass as much of that exploratory knowledge onto my students as I can without making mistakes and leading them down blind alleys. Right. I think we have a responsibility of fidelity, you know, the stuff that we learn um, and helping people to get either to the place that we're at or even beyond us, 
right? So from my point of view as a, as a teacher and instructor, uh, I just want to make sure that I keep learning myself, that I'm not going to rest on my laurels and stop training and think that I know things and just stay humble, keep that beginner's mind and keep training and keep passing through whatever it is that I feel like I've I've learned that's going to be useful to people. Um, for the style as a whole, I'd, I'd like to see it more widely embraced. Uh, I'd like to see more people giving it a try, um, not least to dispel some misunderstandings about what it is and how it works, of which there are many, I think. Because <laughs> um, everybody in this dog can you know, post a video on YouTube now, and it seems like everybody from Russia mm. is now and saying it's Sistema. And you, you've got people waving their arms and legs around and putting people down without touching them and you know, weird motions that aren't anything that I would recognize as Sistema <laughs> anyway. But um, so I would like to see like more people trying Sistema for the benefits that it has outside of martial arts. There's a lot that you can do with it in terms of stress management, in terms of emotional control, in terms of helping to helping kids to develop in a healthy way. Um, and in terms of interpersonal kind of relations and, and also practical kind of situational awareness, things that can get you out of emergencies. I mean, in my entire time that I've been training Sistema, I've got into you know, the number of fights I've got into, aren't, I can't even count them on the fingers of one hand. It's like, it's maybe one or two or something like that. And even those didn't end with like bludgeoning and things like that. It's, but I've got out of a lot of situations and accidents that, um, that I think I might not have got out of so quickly or cleanly without it. I, I was in a car crash, um, avoiding an animal near Jordan Lake, North Carolina and plowed into a rail and almost went into a, into a lake. Right. And, and apparently somebody had drowned there the year before or gone straight through the railing and, and went in with their car. Mm. And the entire front end of my car was caved in. And in seconds I'd got out of the passenger window and I was just staring at this crumpled car. Um, and somebody pulled up in the car and they're like, Oh my God, who's in there? What? And I was like, yeah, that was me. I was in there <laughs> and I was completely calm. You know, I wasn't adrenalized. I just, I just breathed. I used the techniques and it's no, you know, accident that we trained how to get in and out of cars, out of windows, how to get out of a car when the seatbelt is jammed, how to fight in and around cars. We've done all this in seminars, right? So that stuff kicked in and I was relaxed enough to get out. And if, if that car had been on fire or something, or it, I'd had to get my kids out, that, that would have made a really big difference. And as it was, I escaped uninjured because I was relaxed enough when I hit. Um, I've fallen off a motorcycle. Now I sound like I'm prone to vehicle accidents, but I'm not. This is over a period of many years, right? Um, I came off a motorcycle. I came around the corner and there was a van in the wrong lane coming into me and on, on you know, the oncoming lane of um, the road that I was coming into. And I turned hard and did what's called a high side fall on a motorcycle, right? You know, when the, mo the bike tips in the direction of travel. And I came flying off of it and just went into like a light roll and then ran back and picked my bike up like, oh, my bike, my bike. I hope it's okay. <laughs> and the guys in the van stopped and were like, hey, man, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And they walked and they drove off and then it, it took me about three four seconds to be like hey wait a minute like to be angry about the fact that they they were on the wrong side of the road i was so concerned about my bike uh, i forgot to be injured and i just i landed in exactly the same way as i'd seen those guys all those years ago you know and as i've done many times before since roll around on a hard surface without really doing much i had like a little scuff on the top of my crash helmet and that was it so these things like stepping off a curb and rolling your ankle over and it doing nothing to your ankle because you've spent so long working on that loaded mobility as we do in Sistema. All these things that have kept me uninjured and undamaged and able to go about my daily life and work and and my duties as a father and a husband, all of these things to me are, are way more important than whether or not I'm the biggest badass. And I think mm. even though those are harder skills to market, um, I'd like to see Sistema adopted more widely in more places as a, as a path to resilience, strength and self-development rather than as a path to like, we'll make you more badass than the other martial arts guy. You know, I, <laughs> I think those days are done. And I, I, I don't think anybody, I don't know. I don't know if anybody is buying that anymore. Anybody that really wants to, oh, maybe 20 are. year olds are buying it because they still want to fight people and things like that. But they, they, they yeah. are, it's dying. It's certainly dying. It's not yeah. as, as prominent as it used to be. Yeah. Uh, but, but I, 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 and that's not the most useful thing it can do or that I can do. No. So I'd much rather take somebody from, you know, I've worked with people who are 60, 70 years old who have have real problems having like fused back vertebrae from an old injury or something or terrible knees. And I've got them from hardly being able to hobble around to doing like full flat footed squats and wrestling with, you know, guys who are 20 or 30 and just feeling healthy and breathing well and then taking up jogging or something. And to me, that's way more valuable than taking somebody who's in rude health, who is already pretty healthy and then making them like a more of an elite athletic specimen, right? That's, 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 that has its benefits and it's nice to see people become good fighters and good movers and things like that. But when you take somebody who's either psychologically, 
psychologically fragile. They've suffered abuse or an assault or something, and you get them to a place where they can tolerate physical contact and they can tolerate quite a lot of, um, you know, impact or load on their joints and things. And, and, and they're no longer fragile, right? You make them solid as people. I think that's what Sistema really does. It, it creates solid people. And I think we need a lot more of that right now, especially right now. <laughs> I agree. I like the way you, you, you said something a, a few minutes ago. I forgot to be injured. Yeah. And I, I think that that's, that's a great summary for a lot of the things that you said, you know, it's, it's, it's mindset, but it's real. It's, it's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not even going to try to say it any better. <laughs> it, people listening may want to look you up, you know, website, social media, any of that stuff, where would they go? Yeah, they can go to um just NC, that's North Carolina Sistema, which is just system with an A on the end of it, dot com. So ncsystema.com. Um, and if they want to look into our online classes we're doing right now, if they're elsewhere, they're not they don't happen to be right where we are in North Carolina. It's just ncsystema.com slash online. Um, so you can train at least the the physical foundations, the the breathing, the structure development exercises. Um, and some of the weapons work and things at home. And then if you have a Sistema school near you, most big cities have at least one Sistema instructor. I can't vouch for all of them, but I know probably about <laughs> about 75% of them uh, in the in North America at least. Um, but yeah, just look them up, try classes like anything else. It's the, the proof is in the pudding of the instructor that you work with really. you know, There are good and bad instructors in all styles and good and bad emphases of things. So just go try it out, see if it's for you. Nice, sounds good. Well, I, I really appreciate you being here and, you know, kind of anytime we have someone on who it's the first person to come on of that style, they, they end up in this de facto place of having to kind of offer context yeah, for yeah. that style. And, and so I appreciate not only your willingness, but your ability to express it in a way that I think the majority of the listeners get so that that's really valuable. So thanks for doing that. Yeah, not at all. And I apologize if anybody's taken anything the wrong way in what I've said. I've I yeah. up my, hey. up my utmost respect for anybody who's training any martial art um, to the path of self-development. If they're doing it to make themselves better people, please continue doing what you're doing. And if it's working for you, do more of it. Um, I'm just offering an individual perspective on, on my yeah. own path. So. We've, we've got a pretty good audience. You know, they... Um, they've heard me put my foot in my mouth over the years. They've, they've heard people come on and, and say things that they didn't quite mean and, you know, catch a, a little bit of hate once in a while, but as a, a percentage of the listeners, it's very, very little. So I'm very thankful for this audience. They, they're, sure. they're really supportive. And I think the majority of people here get it, you know, Sistema works for you. It yeah. is the thing that works for you, that you dig, you're passionate about it. Doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with what they do or or what you do because they do something different. And, exactly. and I think just yeah. about everybody here understands that. Great. And so as we wind down, I mean, we, we've talked about a lot today, and I'm going to record an outro in a few minutes. But how do you how do you want to lead out to the outro? What what final words? What really powerful? No pressure. Thoughts? <laughs> do you want to wrap up this great conversation with? Because it really has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, I would just say, whatever you're training, always start with the why. Start with the motivation of, of why you're doing it. If, you, if you're doing this because you're afraid and that you want to learn to defend yourself, then that will determine the ways and the mindset within, what you train, within which you train. If you're doing it to develop confidence or to better understand other people, you'll go that path. And it's easy to lose sight of the why. Sometimes you can start for one reason and then your training, you change over time, but your training doesn't. And you want to make sure that there's not a mismatch between what you're training and why you're training. So even to the microcosm of every single class, when you show up, like, why am I here right now? And when the instructor is telling you to practice a certain drill, ask, why would he be getting me to do this? What's the point of this? You know, just constantly ask yourself, What's the motivation? Why am I learning this? Because it's too easy to tune out and just do things by rote. And, and that way, misery lies, I think. <laughs> it's, it's, it's much better to be fully engaged in what you're doing and to understand why. And then you can enjoy like a lifetime of joy in your training, whichever style that you, you choose to follow. This was a fun conversation. Mr. Murphy's a great storyteller, as you could tell. I had a lot of fun and laughed quite a bit. And I came away with a better understanding of, of not just him and what makes him tick, but Sistema and... Honestly, give me some ideas for some new drills. It's a good talk. And this is one of the things I love about the show, the variety. So 
Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate you coming on the show and let's talk again soon. If you want more, if you want photos and links and all the other good stuff, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you're willing to support us, buy something in the store or leave a review or the buy a book or the Patreon, you know, whatever works for you. We, we appreciate it. And, you know, to those of you who have left reviews and shared episodes and stuff, you know, I, I see that. I thank you. It really means a lot. Helps us keep the lights on. And if you see somebody out in the world who, you know, has a whistle kick hat or a hoodie or something like that, just go up, say hello, connect with them. We're all martial artists. And if you want to reach out to me, if you've got some feedback from an episode or a suggestion for a guest or something like that, Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, you know how it goes. Train hard, smile, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.